Hello and welcome to Airheads, a not-so-serious look at the serious business of royal rumours, gossip and gowns. I'm Tom. And I'm Maeve. And this has been a big week for celebrations, both royal-themed and otherwise. It was Tom's birthday this week. Very exciting celebration. It was also the ninth wedding anniversary for Prince William and Kate Middleton. And it was Princess Charlotte's birthday too. So, Tom, do you want to tell me how you celebrated your birthday in in lockdown? (laughs) Yeah, it was definitely a kind of strange birthday, but it was a really, really nice day. I got an incredible present. My best present was champagne and chocolate covered honeycomb from Charles and Camilla's High Grove Estate. (laughs) Um, I originally thought that it was a personal gift from the Duke and Duchess, but Maeve revealed that it was actually all down to her. Uh, So that was my best present. And my worst present was a one-star review from somebody who was asking if we get paid by the Cambridges. (laughs) If we got paid by the Cambridges, oh my god, you wouldn't hear the sirens outside our window every episode. We'd be in a a taxpayer-funded studio and someone would edit these episodes for us. I remember the first birthday of yours that we celebrated together was actually the day that Kate and Will got married. Yeah. It was the the night before that you had your birthday party in the college dorms when we were studying in Dublin. And Tom had like a a royal wedding themed party. It was very ironic though, because Tom was a a very anarchic student. (laughs) Um, But I remember you had like Union Jack bunting around the walls and I made like a sponge cake and I also wore that (laughs) I did my own interpretation of that see-through dress that Kate wore in her college fashion show which I thought was uh, a a nice tribute to the the royal bride and there was also I believe a plastic version of Diana's ring (laughs) oh yeah yeah I actually I still have that I think the the blue Kate's engagement ring I bought it in Morrison's (laughs) (laughs) But yeah, now here we are, nine years later. What do we know? It lasted. (laughs) Kate and Will were celebrating. I was hoping we'd get a new picture of them, but unfortunately we didn't. We did, however, get new pictures of Princess Charlotte, who turned five. And wow, these were pretty special pictures, right? The new pics that we got showed Charlotte marking her birthday by delivering care packages to vulnerable and elderly people in the area around Sandringham. (laughs) These weren't just any care packages, though. This was clear plastic bags, all the better to show off the homemade pasta made by Charlotte and her family and tied with a lovely rustic straw ribbon. Yeah, a very Pinterest touch. So the the main picture that we saw was this kind of close-up, very moody portrait. We know Kate loves these very dark portraits. She, it reminded me of those pictures she took in Pakistan, you yeah. know, with the very dark background and the light just on the face, quite somber portrait. A bit of an unusual choice for a birthday portrait. But anyway, that was the one that was on a lot of the front pages and was quite ominous, I thought. <laughs> but then we got some really good ones, like kind of almost candid ones of her moving as she was like picking up the bags and then one of her going to knock on someone's door holding this bag of pasta. And I just, it blew my mind that they had the the pasta out for all the world to see in this clear bag. So nobody missed the fact <laughs> that this was not dried pasta. This was fresh pasta made by the hands of the princess herself. I mean, she's certainly not alone in lockdown, like, baking pride, because everyone seems to be showing pictures kind of like that. But this was taking it to a new level. I couldn't believe it. I mean, we did talk, it was last week, wasn't it? It was Louis' birthday. Yeah. And we talked about how Kate was very savvy in doing the rainbow portraits for the NHS, the hand-painted ones, and that that was, like, a nice little touch in that it was cute and child-friendly and... You like, could do it yourself at home. Yeah, but it was also a nod to the work of the frontline staff. But we were thinking, like, I remember I was talking to her the week, and we were like, how is she going to top this? Yeah. What is she going to do? And I was saying, like, maybe they'll do her making banana bread or some kind of family activity that's, like, wholesome and cooking related. Mm. But they stepped it up into 
high gear, turbo gear yeah. with, <laughs> with this homemade pasta. I just can't get over it. The mail had some more details. So the, the deliveries that Kate and Will and Charlotte were doing were part of a local initiative started by the Queen's staff. So they have been preparing and delivering meals for the last five weeks. And in the first week, they delivered around a thousand meals, according to the mail. And the Cambridge has decided to get involved by making this homemade pasta. They ended up making 12 bags of it. So if you got one, this was some extremely limited edition kit. This is like royal hype beast, kind of. <laughs> this is the supreme of <laughs> the British royal family. Who's going to be eating that? Me, I would eat it. Um, <laughs> so apparently all the children, even Louis, were involved in making this. I would what love to Louis? see what contribution Louis made. <laughs> But anyway, the next day after making this pasta, they then helped to load the bags of fresh produce into a van from the Sandringham Visitor Centre. And they spent two and a half hours driving around delivering food. This was Kate, Will, Charlotte and George. Louis didn't take part in this one. Slacker. But <laughs> I, I just, I thought it was so funny that Rebecca English at the mail described it as Meals on Wills. <laughs> that yeah. was pretty good, right? Yeah, that's good. But anyway, do you want to get into how you felt when you saw these knockout photos? Yeah, I I thought it was way too much. I thought this was Will and Kate going too far. I kind of felt like, just celebrate her on her birthday. We all, you know, understand about what's going on. And there are other days you could bring attention to this initiative. I would have just liked to see her kind of like enjoying herself. <laughs> and I thought that it was more to show like, how good Will and Kate were than to celebrate Charlotte. So you thought it was kind of self-serving? Yeah. I mean, I thought she looked adorable. She was wearing this, like, checked Zara dress with a little ruffle collar, very nice thick wool tights. Kind of (laughs) reminded me of something like the Queen would have worn when she was a little girl. But, yeah, it was, like, nice, like, kind of fun and playful outfit, but also, like, somber. And she looked pretty happy delivering the packages. But I, I did feel like it was sort of competitive Kate and Will doing the most (laughs) and I know they had really set the bar very high with those Louis photos but that really felt like something that everybody could take part in and this was just like only the world's number one parents (laughs) and the world's number one little kids can do something like this it's it's sort of outside the bounds of relatability (laughs) in my opinion obviously it would be great if it did set a trend of of people like volunteering with their kids but that's just not realistic yeah you know for most people it's like they are glued to the ipad all day long and because that's the only way (laughs) everyone can get through the day yeah that's totally fine (laughs) (laughs) and that is considered a, a triumph for us if we can get through the day you know, there is this very fine line between what people want from the royals in terms of being relatable and being aspirational and how out of reach yeah. <laughs> some of the stuff they do is compared to the more like, we're just like you kind of stuff. We did get some kind of more relatable details from her actual birthday day, because obviously, like the rest of us, they're in lockdown. There's a lot of Zoom calls, what I'd like to call Charlotte's Web based birthday. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> she had Zoom calls with family and friends, which included the Queen and her best friend, Philip. <laughs> they also had a long walk and picnic, which is maybe like less relatable to, <laughs> to the rest of us. <laughs> but I really like this source in The Sun who said, Philip has no shortage of descendants. The fact that he takes such a close interest in Charlotte is telling. She has a spark about her that transcends the generations. Man, the way, like, posh British people talk is <laughs> <laughs> unlike anyone else. But now that you're talking about Philip and the Queen on the Zoom call, yeah, they were Zooming in from their base in Windsor Castle, where they are isolating. We, we talked before about how we felt so sorry for them because they were isolating with, like, five staff or something. But now we got an update from The Sun that actually they're locked down with 22 staff. (laughs) This absolutely repulsive line in The Sun's report, they are being looked after by their favourite servants. Oh, Oh, That's just like 
sort of uh, makes you shiver with yeah, kind of no. revolving. <laughs> but anyway, this operation has been dubbed HMS Bubble. <laughs> <laughs> And the staff that are manning HMS Bubble won't be seeing their families for weeks because no risks can be taken and they can't go in and out. The most important thing, according to a source who's talking to The Sun, is to protect the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh from the virus. If something happened to them, it doesn't bear thinking about. So The Sun learned about these 22 staff from a a memo that had been sent by the Master of the Household, Tony Johnston Burst, who's a former Navy officer. And in his memo, they posted the full thing on on The Sun's website, if you want to read it. He compares the situation to a long overseas deployment where sailors would be separated from their families for several months and delisted. The website had this really good blog about it where one of their writers, Micah, noted that this is something Steve the footman in charge of trimming Philip's nose hairs without waking him up can surely relate to. (laughs) So funny. Such a good line. Because it's my birthday week, I'm allowed to do a little Camilla update. (laughs) You can do a Camilla update every week, you know. But this was one of my favourite bits of Camilla um, action. (laughs) No. Oh. (laughs) (laughs) This is one of my favourite Camilla updates, I think, ever. Because she has proved once again that she is our ultimate relatable royal. Because she revealed on a Zoom call that she is learning ballet online. (laughs) So this was in support of an initiative called Silver Swans, who make ballet tutorials aimed at the over 55s. And also on the call with her were Angela Rippon, uh, who's a, an ambassador for Silver Swans, and Dame Darcy Bustle, <laughs> president of the Royal Academy of Dance. And she is just like us, Camilla. She's using quarantine to learn new skills and move her dance and Pilates classes online. She does them every morning and she's a digital native. House party, Pilates, <laughs> where will it end? This is my public plea that Someone at the Clarence House staff needs to get Camilla to do an IGTV video <laughs> of her do- doing the ballet. Pilates Please. with Camilla. Like, that would just be the, the most incredible belated birthday gift for you and yeah. for all of us. Aside from the Zoom calls, though, we did get some pretty professional quality videos at last from Prince Harry. I was delighted to see this. You might remember a few weeks ago, we talked about the HeadFit initiative, this kind of mysterious project that Harry had been working on a few years ago. And then recently, Will and Kate had trademarked the word HeadFit. And people were kind of thinking, what were Will and Kate doing? Were they encroaching on Harry's territory? Were they stealing credit for his project? Whatever. No, Harry has launched this project now it is a collaboration with the royal foundation's heads together campaign that harry obviously started with kate and will and it's a mental fitness tool for the armed forces and this week the website launched headfit.org and there's a little video of harry on the website and he's speaking very confidently he says if you want to be truly fit strong and healthy you need to train your mind and body as one And it's crystal clear. And he's got like a fresh haircut. (laughs) It's great. It was really nice to have it not in a Zoom format. It's kind of the first time almost that we've seen a royal since the Queen's Address, not on Zoom. Yeah. (laughs) Or like kind of grainy photos. So that was really good to see. But slightly less good to see was an article talking about how he misses his military pals so much. Yeah, this was an exclusive in the Telegraph this week with a friend of Harry's. The friend tells Telegraph, he misses the camaraderie of being in the forces. He's been telling friends that he still can't believe this has happened. He can't believe his life has been turned upside down. He was in a happy place when he was serving in the army. Then he met Megan and since then life has been great, but I don't think he foresaw things turning out quite as they did. And the friend goes on to say, there's just a sense that he might have been better protected if he was still in the army. It's so weird. Like, we've seen articles that also have been like a friend of Megan's talking to the Daily Mail. And I just, I don't believe that friends of either of them are talking to like any papers at the moment, (laughs) given everything that's going on. Yeah, and it just feeds into this weird narrative of, I've heard some people describe it as like, 
some some British people talking about Harry as if they're like a jilted lover mm. and that he has abandoned Britain yeah. for America. And th- this idea that he should have stayed here, he should have stayed in the armed forces, he, he, he's abandoned us. And, you know, if he hadn't abandoned us, he would be protected and we would have kept him safe. And it's such a weird narrative. And as well as that, the friend sort of casually drops in about Harry. He doesn't blame Meghan. Which really, like, that kind of line only serves to put that in people's minds, right? Like, why would he blame Meghan for yeah. leaving the military? He left the military a year before he even met Meghan. Yeah, exactly. If and you're talking about him missing the camaraderie of the military, Meghan has nothing to do with that. Yeah, exactly. And it wasn't Meghan who stripped him of his military titles. <laughs> exactly. So who who is this friend is <laughs> yeah i mean i think best case scenario like most charitable thing i can kind of think of is that it is somebody in the military who is friendly with harry who like is sad that he doesn't have his military titles and things anymore and is kind of wants to make the point that harry it's, would still be such a good part of the military and the military would be really good for him and that this uh, relationship it's sad that it's gone like that's the kind of most positive thing i could think of and that maybe these quotes have been put in a certain order and in a certain kind of tone but you know, that's me being kind of naive, I think. I mean, obviously we'll never know. I do wonder if it's possibly a member of the royal family, possibly someone in the Cambridge camp. I don't know. But on to more positive things, because we got another HD video <laughs> of Harry introducing an episode of Thomas and Friends, which we know better as Thomas the Tank Engine. I mean... I will say I'm slightly bummed at the number of times we've seen royals talking to or about people called Thomas who aren't me (laughs) over the last week. (laughs) But Harry was a fan of Thomas the Tank Engine before you were even born, I think. (laughs) He carried a little Thomas the Tank Engine bag on his first day at nursery. And he was also seen wearing a Thomas the Tank Engine t-shirt with Diana he it must have been such a dream come true for him then. I know, it's very sweet. Those pictures of him are adorable. But now it's the 75th anniversary of Thomas the Tank Engine and Harry has done a little introduction to a special episode called Thomas and Friends, The Royal Engine. It was filmed back in January, hence the kind of professional quality <laughs> of it. It was before everyone locked down. He's got a great voiceover reading style. I feel like he definitely got some tips from Megan. Oh yeah. Because like... His, uh, his rhythm is great. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what, what should I say there? That's fine. <laughs> no, that it's okay, just He's got a great <laughs> He says, It all began when a young boy lay ill in bed. His loving father entertained him with stories of a special railway on the magical island of Sodor. Those stories would go on to become the tales of the most iconic tank engine the world has ever known. Thomas, the tank engine. And he gave this performance in exchange for a donation to environmental and sustainability projects as part of Travelist. So that's the sustainable tourism program that he's fronting at the moment. We did actually watch the episode as well. (laughs) I was not a big Thomas Tank Engine fan, but I know you were. What what, what did you make of this episode? (laughs) I mean, it's definitely a really kind of uncontroversial thing to be part of. Like, Thomas Tank Engine is beloved in Britain. In this episode, we have Topham Top Hat, or whatever his name is, which is... Sir Topham Hat. (laughs) Sorry, Sir Topham Hat, which is apparently the real name of the man I always knew as the Fat Controller. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But he has been summoned to London by the Queen to receive an award and also requested... Was Thomas the Tank Engine? He's got to bring Topham Top Hat. Topham Hat. Top- <laughs> oh my God, Topham Hat, by special request from the Prince, who is unnamed, but it's Charles. Yeah, and on their journey to London, where Thomas doesn't know the, the way, they meet Duchess. Who- the Duchess, uh, a female train. <laughs> <laughs> She's a a silver train. She transports the royals she has some very important passengers on board and she needs to get to london on time she's Um, voiced by rosamund pike and she has freckles which i thought was interesting nod to certain duchess yeah maybe it's a bit of a reach i didn't really see that 
but she is carrying the queen and Charles. This is set in the past. So Charles is like a little boy and they never say his name, but he's wearing a baseball cap with the letter C on it, (laughs) which I'm sure Charles wore all the time when he was a kid. (laughs) And yeah, he's a massive fan of Thomas and he demands to be allowed to put Thomas's medal on. Oh, mother, may I please? Oh, a splendid idea. Please. And he like waves his hands in the air. (laughs) And it's all that kind of like 3D style animation, so it's just all quite uncanny. But anyway, yeah, it was a fun little thing. It was a, it was a good idea for Harry to contribute to that. Yeah, it kind of made me think of, is he reading these kind of stories to Archie? Very cute. We also saw some stuff from Megan this week as well. She was on a Zoom call with the team from SmartWorks, which is the organisation she's worked with before. They help women into the workforce through job interview training and provides them with outfits for those interviews as well. So she did the smart set with them uh, back last year when she was uh, guest editing British Vogue. So in particular, we saw her on this Zoom call talking to one of their clients who is a woman who's about to start an internship in the field of psychology. And she thanked Megan for all her support and advocacy and said how much it meant to her. Yeah, it was a really nice call. Megan looked absolutely amazing. I thought what was interesting about this was that there was a little date stamp on it that said it was filmed on the 27th of March, but it was only released a month later on what happened to be Kate and Will's wedding anniversary. (laughs) (laughs) I just thought that was curious timing. And I think, you know, it's just as well that Will and Kate were working away on their wedding anniversary as well, so everyone was just business as usual, so let's just assume there was no uh, controversy there. (laughs) Unfortunately for Megan, she had a minor legal setback this week because the judge in her case against Associated Newspapers, the publisher of The Mail on Sunday, delivered his ruling on Friday. We talked last week about that initial virtual court hearing about whether to strike out parts of Megan's case. And on Friday, he said he would be striking out her allegations that the publisher of the Mail Sunday had acted dishonestly by leaving out certain passages of the letter. He also struck out her allegations that the publisher had deliberately stirred up issues between Meghan and Thomas Markle and that it had an agenda of publishing intrusive or offensive stories about her. He said that those allegations should not form part of her case at this stage because they were irrelevant to her claim for misuse of private information, copyright infringement and breach of the Data Protection Act. But he did say that those parts of her case may be revived at a later stage if they are put on a proper legal basis. And I I saw that Byline Investigates said that this means the parts that the judge deemed were not pleaded properly could be added back in if they were rephrased. Byline Investigates also quoted a legal source who said, the main reason for the strikeout is the sections are peripheral to the case and will increase costs and complexity. This will affect the levels of potential damages, but not the prospects of success at court. And as a spokesperson for Shillings, the law firm representing Megan, said today's ruling makes very clear that the core elements of the case do not change and will continue to move forward so she's not going to appeal if the case continues but this was presented as a major loss for Megan in a lot of the media over here and you know it's not great optics the the first part of the case is is her losing something even if it is something as minor as this Mm -hmm. and just to have that as part of the narrative so early on is unfortunate for Megan, I think. But just from our point of view, in terms of looking at the reaction over here, it did seem like the conclusion at this point is Megan is losing the battle. Yeah, which doesn't seem to necessarily be the case, but that definitely is the vibe. To cheer us up, though, (laughs) let's talk about the annual official royal gift list that was released last week. Oh my god, this is so funny. Thank you to one of our listeners, Amanda, who sent us this list. But some of the notables that really stood out to me was Charles received a pair of swimming trunks. (laughs) (laughs) Imagine the thought that we're going to picking out some trunks for Charles. It's just so intimate. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) 
Uh, the queen received a 24 carat gold plated horse comb, <laughs> which is like absolutely what you get for the woman who has everything. <laughs> and what you get for Will is 10 hats. <laughs> In Pakistan, Kate and Will received 10 hats between them. Would love to see what those hats look like. Oh, yeah. I'm surprised Will doesn't wear more hats. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's, there's loads of stuff for Archie, of course. Yeah, and this is likely to be his last appearance on this list of official royal gifts. But among his massive haul were a pair of brown leather lederhosen. <laughs> <laughs> Please let those be part of the birthday picture we're going to get next week. I would love to see those. I mean, that is like the German answer to dungarees, right? <laughs> <laughs> so he's probably really into them. He also got a pilot's log book, a surf vest, and four soft toy pretzels, which that's... What is a soft toy pretzel? Is that like a really popular toy in Germany or some other country that... I guess it must be. Like, I imagine it's quite cute. Yeah, no, I looked it up and they are cute, but I just never heard of that. And to receive not one, not two, not three, but four, makes <laughs> yeah. me think this is a well, phenomenon. I feel like over here and I don't know, maybe in America, I feel like soft toy avocados and stuff would have been really big at one point. Like whatever the kind of like trendy food is at the time people get really into but i enjoyed that Catelyn moran wrote in the times about this list and she said in previous years the queen alone has been given two sloths a model of the brandenburg gate made of marzipan an elephant that she had to discreetly regift to london zoo <laughs> and a bag of horse semen worth five thousand pounds from a horse called big bad bob <laughs> Which is funny because that was your original idea for my birthday. <laughs> <laughs> this is so good. But, okay, finally, final thing on Harry and Meghan. We heard last week that a book about Harry and Meghan is in the works. The Mail on Sunday had a report on it, but we didn't talk about it because we weren't sure about it. Yeah. This week, however, Harper Collins have put a listing for this book on the website, the American website. It is allegedly called Finding Freedom. And is written by Omid Scobie, the Harper's Bazaar journalist, and Carolyn Durand, who's a contributor to American Elle magazine. But their names are spelled backwards on the listing. Because I saw it on Google Books earlier in the week. Mm. And they also had these the names spelled backwards. I don't know if this is a common thing in publishing. If you work in publishing, you can let us know, please. But it all just seems so mysterious. But now that there's a cover up on the Harper Collins website, it seems like something that's definitely happening. Yeah. And it has a little blurb and part of the blurb says, with unique access and written with the participation of those closest to the couple. Yeah. So this, I mean, there's been kind of chatter about whether there'll be an interview with Harry and Meghan within it, but... That's what the mail said last yeah. Sunday that we weren't sure about. I feel like the phrase, with the participation of those closest to the couple, means that there's not going to be a direct interview, but that there'll be a lot of sources and friends and kind of inferences. Or that Harry and Meghan will talk to them on background and just be unnamed and the quotes will be attributed to a friend. Yeah. Much like what Diana did when she spoke to Andrew Morton for his book... But I don't know, I'm, obviously I'm going to read this book, but yeah. I don't know if it's a great idea for Harry and Meghan to do this now. The date on the listing is that it will be published on the 11th of August. And I just feel like at that time, they still won't have been able to launch Archwell. It's likely that they'll still be in lockdown up till around that time. And it just seems like it's too soon for this to be coming out, in my opinion. It seems like this is kind of the pre-corona rollout that they're, and they're sticking yeah. to it. Because, you know, it would give them, what, kind of like six months of being out of the royal family to have yeah. really established what they were going to do. And as they've said themselves, like now is not the time to be talking about Archwell and setting out all these kind of things. And yeah, I agree with you that I would like them to maybe even delay it a year so that we can really kind of get a sense of who they are outside of the royal family. 
Um, and that it would give them more perspective because I feel like it's all still so raw yeah. now that even just to put some distance between it could bring a deeper insight to the whole story. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree. But from one set of American royals <laughs> to another. <laughs> yes, we have been talking for a few weeks now that we wanted to read Catherine McGee's American Royals and we've finally done it. So let's get down to it, Tom. Just to note from here on in, there's going to be a lot of spoilers. So if you haven't read it yet and you don't want to be spoiled, go and read it and then come back. But, you know, if you're just interested, I did think it was a very interesting book. So maybe you might just want to hear lean into the spoilers <laughs> so the premise of this book in case you read it a while ago and you um it's kind of not too clear to you george washington instead of becoming america's first president became their first king and he knighted various lords and ladies so the u.s has both monarchy and an aristocracy so they have people like the duke of orange who we think is kind of like california kind of area and also the duke of boston yeah and this story is told from the perspectives of four characters. So you have Beatrice, who is the first in line to the throne, future queen. She's 21 years old. And at the start of the book, her parents hand her a file with a list of potential husbands because she has to marry another aristocratic person. And the time is is now. So she has to find herself a husband. But the trouble is she's in love with someone else, her bodyguard. Hunky Connor. (laughs) Meanwhile, you've got Samantha, who is Beatrice's younger sister. She's 18 and she's a twin. So she has twin brother, Jeff. Uh, She's also a bit of a wild child and she's on her gap year after graduating high school. And she's pretty aimless until she meets Teddy, a very charming and handsome man who unfortunately becomes Beatrice's fiancé. Then you have Sam's best friend, Nina, who is 18. She is a college student and her mother used to work for the king. And Nina starts dating Jeff secretly. But when it all goes public and kind of blows up in her face and she receives very intense tabloid scrutiny, which may sound familiar to some Mm. of you listening. And then the final perspective is that of Daphne, who is Jeff's ex-girlfriend. She's 17, she's a social climber, she's beautiful, and she is desperate to get him back. So she's hiding as well the secret about a friend of hers, Himari, who had a tragic accident and has been in a coma ever since. Yeah, so you've got those are the four main characters. And as we said, it's written by Catherine McGee, who is from Texas. She also wrote the Thousands Floor series, which I am definitely going to read now after reading this. But she says in her little author's note at the end that she's been working on American Royals since 2012. And on her website as well, she says that she studied English and French literature in college and she's been speculating about American royalty since her undergrad days when she wrote a thesis on castle envy, the idea that the American psyche is missing out on something because Americans don't have a royal family of their own. That's so interesting to me. I would I love know, to read I want to read the thesis. thesis. <laughs> yeah, yeah. She said, I think I'm drawn to the idea of destiny. Characters who feel trapped but want to make their own choices are endlessly interesting. And it's hard to create a sense of fate in the modern world unless there is a crown at stake. Yeah, and that definitely makes sense because the book is very much like a romance. Mm. And that idea of like a forbidden love is, you know, pretty irresistible. But it's kind of hard to find an example where you would have a forbidden love in modern day. So to introduce this structure of monarchy really adds that back into it. Because I was listening to another podcast where Catherine McGee did an interview and she talked about her first attempt writing the book the year after Kane Will got married. And she said it was much more of like a political thriller, like House of Cards style, that it was very male and that it was about a king with an illegitimate child and there was an assassination attempt and all this stuff. And that is worlds away from the, the finished product. So, uh, you know... That... I want to see that draft as well, though. Uh, yeah. <laughs> like, just release it all. <laughs> yeah, that sounds good too. But anyway, to get onto this version, you read it before me and you had to hold on to all your thoughts because I didn't want to hear yeah. anything about it until I'd finished <laughs> it. So what were you thinking? What were you dying to tell me now that you can finally unleash it all? <laughs> I mean, I wanted to just say, like, Connor's so hot. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I knew you'd love him. 
Which of the characters was your favourite? I really liked reading from Samantha's perspective. I thought she was uh, like the most fun. I loved that she has her own custom lip gloss colour that nobody <laughs> else is allowed. I feel like that would be such a good perk of being a royal. <laughs> Uh, but I, fe- I felt like in terms of like identifying with someone, Nina was probably the easiest to identify because she had more of an outside perspective on yeah. royalty. What about you? Yeah, I, I agree. I, I did like Sam's chapters a lot. I also really enjoyed Beatrice's because I'm a sucker for the forbidden love story. <laughs> <laughs> and the idea of her carrying this burden of, you know, all the responsibility of her role and how she's been training all her life to do this. And you just like feel so much for her because she's only 21. And the idea of like having to take on that kind of role is just so heavy. Yeah. Heavy as the head. <laughs> and wears the crown. Um, you just like the chapters that have the sex in them. <laughs> <laughs> you don't care about the royals. <laughs> I did find Daphne very interesting. I have to say hers were not my favourites. I often took those opportunities to stop before bed. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Because she was a little bit outside of the action. And the stuff with Himari did feel quite separate to the the rest of the story. But her motivations and how complicated she was, that was occasionally very compelling. Yeah. And I really enjoyed her little dalliance with Ethan, who's Jeff's best friend. I I am hoping that they find their way back to each other. Yeah, I think that would be really good. Obviously reading this as people who follow the British Royals as closely as we do, I had that top of my mind. How did you think they compared to or measured up to the British Royals? I thought it was so interesting to see... A world where you have this entirely new monarchy existing alongside, like, the other royal families in the world. Because they do reference, like, the Duke of Windsor, um, who abdicated in UK. And that was, I suppose, part of the kind of wider world building of it. That it hinted at all these other characters that we know, but would maybe be a bit different. Because, you know, maybe there'd be a Harry, but maybe there wouldn't be a Meghan, you know? Yeah. So that was really interesting to me. And I did like every time there was a little allusion to something from rumours or tabloid stories about the British royals that have kind of been applied to this royal family. Like the mock knighting incident. Yeah. You might remember a few years ago, Ed Sheeran had like a cut on his cheek and he explained it by saying that Princess Beatrice had done like a fake knighting ceremony with him and accidentally like sliced his cheek open with a sword (laughs) (laughs) which is just an amazing story but then later on James Blunt said that Echeren had made the whole thing up and it never happened which is quite disappointing but in the world of this book it does happen and it's very funny and you also got like little kind of details like Beatrice has handbag signals with her staff and her bodyguards and things to show like when she wants to leave and things which is something that we've read about with the, the queen, queen does, yeah. Uh, that if she puts it on the floor, like, she's getting the hell out of there. Yeah. Kind of thing. <laughs> they also do the hospital steps, the baby photos, and she talks about how the queen mother, Beatrice's mother, makes a point of wearing her old pre-pregnancy jeans home from the hospital just to show that she can. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and there's even a controversial Aunt Margaret <laughs> who was forbidden from marrying the man that she loved and then it's kind of like oh was she ever happy after that and kind of like that so that's very interesting obviously allusion to princess margaret and she's drunk all the time oh yeah 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 yeah. jeff's social media alias is spike wales i like so much actually that was one of the things that was one of the things where i was like i'm so annoyed maeve hasn't read this already so i can like (laughs) tell her immediately They have like a nice little shady detail about how divorce was something only European royals did. I mean, boy, do they do it. (laughs) It's so funny that because it was like they're even more kind of traditional and conservative than the British royal family are right now. Yeah. I did wonder if there were maybe shades of the Middletons in the Daphne storyline because I was thinking if she had been thinking about this from just after Kate and Will's wedding Mm. that you know, some of the media coverage of Kate in the run-up to the wedding had been about 
her being a social climber and this theory that she and her mother had plotted for her to snare Will and that Carol Middleton was allegedly this sort of very scheming social climber and you definitely have like all of the you know the worst speculations about uh, Kate's personality and Carol as well in the relationship between Daphne and her mother I really liked the bit where Daphne describes her approach to charity work and how certain charity hours are far more worthy than others and that she did 400 hours last year but Samantha only did 14 and like she's keeping track of all those things yeah but I did find it unusual that pretty early on I think like in the first 10 pages it says that Beatrice had long ago been trained to keep her emotions hidden from public display and this idea that even the American royals have to have that stiff upper lip like they just describe a party where people are walking around in that stiff Washington palace sort of way and you would think because you know all the stuff you hear about Americans and about Megan and stuff like that is that they're so emotional and that they don't have that thing of like having to keep their emotions in check like British people do but the idea that that's something that an American monarchy would have sort of trained their royals to do as well is is quite interesting, I think. Because it made me think about it as well, because it was like, well, this is kind of positioning it that that stiff upper lip isn't like a British thing coming from British people. It's more coming from this class structure, which has like a monarchy, but also this kind of aristocracy as well, where there's all these like levels and layers. Um, and, you know, the importance of keeping your emotions behind closed doors in this kind of Game of Thrones style environment yeah. where everyone's jostling for favour and stuff. I thought that was like a really good way of framing it and a good way of bringing that into the American royal family, I thought it was good. And Beatrice is looking at her father, the king, and she reflects on him having two marriages to the queen and to his country. And there's this talk about how the royal spouse must be the right fit for you and America. But the implication is that America needs to come first. Yeah. And I obviously was reading that in the Harry and Will lens as well, where... Kate appears to have really taken that on that the country comes before her and that's why the country is seems to be so in love with her whereas with Megan the criticism is always that she puts herself first yeah so that one is the right fish for the man and the other yeah. is the right fit for the country or actually sorry I think I misspoke I don't think Megan puts herself first I think it's more Harry puts Megan first over the country that's probably what I meant to say You also have later on when Beatrice finally admits to her father that she's in love with Connor and doesn't want to marry Teddy. He says it's a terrible idea because someday when Connor realized just how much he'd given up for you, he would regret his choice. He would come to hate you for it and worse, he would come to hate himself. Really ominous, like doom and gloom kind (laughs) of pretentious stuff. But did you think this kind of also like had shades of kind of Harry and Meghan to it? I know there were certainly a lot of conversations around like Meghan is, like, when they got engaged, you know, Meghan is such a feminist and marrying into the royal family sort of stands in opposition to all all of her beliefs and how much she would have to give up mm. to be with him. And you, you had, you know, people like Jermaine Greer and stuff being like, you know, she's going to bolt once she realises how much she has to sacrifice to be with him and and, and that kind of thing. So that was definitely a conversation that was happening and that just came to my mind. It it brought it up when I was reading about this. But then when, you know, at the very end of the book, you have the king's dying words. Well, he gives her this whole speech about how she has to be strong and she has to do things her way. And that's a really important thing about being a ruler is like having the courage of your convictions. And then he starts to talk about Teddy and Connor And for me, that really, it would follow from what he was saying that she should choose the person that she's in love with and make that work and bring the country and the monarchy forward, be progressive, be strong and progressive, basically. But she takes it as very much him saying like, no, you need to you need to be doing what's best for the country, not yourself. And reiterating something that he said before about, you know, choosing Teddy for the good of the people rather than Connor. Yeah, I totally agree. But we'll get on to the ending in a little bit because I did feel like I've read interviews with Catherine McGee where she talks a lot about the Succession to the Crown Act of 2013, which is where 
it was decided that it wouldn't pass to the eldest male child but the eldest child of the monarch and that was introduced when Charlotte was born and this is obviously a very particular interest for Catherine McGee and she talks about Beatrice having the temerity to be a woman and how there's a lot of opposition to her being queen and how much she struggles with that and there's lots of moments where Beatrice has to go on autopilot or she becomes the marionette version of herself and how you know she's saying thank you and it's a pleasure to meet you so many times that she forgets what the words even mean. And yeah I think that's why I quite like the way I feel the king's mind changes towards the end is that I I read it that he has kind of come to the realisation that having a, a queen is actually a great opportunity to change things and bring things forward. That, like, it's not about pretending she isn't a woman and keeping everything the same as it was and trying to minimise that aspect of it, but to actually play that up. Because, obviously, we've had the queen for as long as we've been alive, but America has never had a female president. Yeah. And all of that, you know, the stuff with Hillary and then you know now again that that's coming up about how much opposition there seems to be in america to the idea of having a woman president and she can kind of write about that under the veil of the monarchy because americans might have a totally different response to that or even i wonder what it would be like if will was a woman or if it was charlotte rather than george who would be become queen if modern day sexism and misogyny would have a totally different take on that than they do on the queen yeah because people have known the queen all their lives and anybody who would have been opposed to her becoming queen is now dead (laughs) but you wonder how that would play out in a modern world well we asked our listeners how they thought the u.s royals compared to their uk counterparts and pretty much everyone was like they're way more fun and I agree like they're so much more laid back in their style at least yeah I mean we first meet Samantha wearing velour sweatpants and a white t-shirt that you can see a pig bra through (laughs) (laughs) which was a great first impression I mean definitely it's more fun to read about royals in their late teens and early 20s than in their late 30s with kids and stuff yeah yeah but they did seem slightly more laid back than (laughs) certainly what we know of the British royals now but I think in general coming to this book as an anti-monarchist it was top of my mind is this book making an argument for Americans to have a monarchy instead of a democracy and I think there are some really interesting moments where she kind of probes that question like there's a bit where Teddy tells Beatrice that he still thinks people would vote for her if you could you know, yeah. for some crazy reason, vote for the monarch. And she thinks, elect the king or queen? What a funny concept. Everyone knew that elections only worked for judges and Congress. Making the executive branch pander to the people, begging for votes, that could only end in disaster. That structure would attract the wrong sort of people, power-hungry people with twisted agendas. So interesting. I mean, not saying that the author believes that but it is that seems like very natural kind of thought coming from someone in that position that like you would be brought up to think that well no this you know the monarchs are just there they're not seeking the power but they have the power pressed upon them and that they train all their lives to do this yeah that they are born to do this (laughs) yeah that kind of you get somebody who has all this experience and uh, whose only role in life is to serve the country. There's nothing else to it, really. And that the monarchy gives a sense of stability that you don't get from constantly electing people from different political parties. But I did find that the sovereign in the world of American royals seems to have a slightly more political role than the queen for instance like it seemed almost like a blend of president and monarch it's not entirely clear what exactly their duties are but there is a moment towards the end where the king tells Beatrice it's so much more than the charity work or the politics the cabinet meetings the ambassador appointments being the commander in chief of the armed forces so it's kind of suggesting all of the work that they'll be doing and maybe in the second book because there is a second book coming Mm -hmm. later this year we'll find out more 
of what the actual day-to-day stuff is because there's a bit as well where he says once Beatrice becomes queen she's not going to be able to pick favorites by working with charities so you know so much of what the queen does is working with charities that you wonder what are they doing as they're not doing the charity work anyway the king goes on more than any of that the most important role of the monarch is still a symbolic one when you are queen the people will look to you as the ultimate symbol of stability in a confusing and ever-changing world the crown is the magic link that holds this country together that keeps all the different states and political parties and types of people peacefully interwoven with one another i mean obviously a king is going to say that yeah, yeah <laughs> we're yeah. not saying this is catherine mcgee's view on it but you would imagine you know i i would say if you asked any monarchist over here that's similar to what they would say and i feel like it's the kind of message we got from the most recent season of the crown as well when they probe what the role of the monarch is in a kind of increasingly modern world and even when the queen gave her coronavirus speech that was what people were saying because obviously the Prime Minister Boris Johnson wasn't well, and to have the Queen as this symbol of stability was was very reassuring for people. But what we are kind of lacking, I think, from this conversation in the book is a kind of Republican sentiment. There's no kind of expressly anti-monarchist character that we meet. I think there's like possibly a mention to people on the fringes of society who don't feel that warmly towards the royal family, but we don't really get a perspective like that. Yeah, and certainly in terms of my interests, I was wondering, I was trying to figure out, like, are they taxpayer funded? Are they politically neutral? What, what what are my problems with the British monarchy? Do I also have those problems with this fictional American monarchy? But I know we did ask listeners last week to tell us what they, they liked about following the royals over here. And they told us that they really appreciated that idea of stability and that the queen is a unifying figure and as well as that that she embodies a lot of the grace and class that some people feel stands in opposition to president trump Mm -hmm. that that is very reassuring to people to have this kind of very clear sense of order that you get in the structure of monarchy compared to to what a lot of people see as the chaos of the current political administration in America. And I can definitely see how that would be comforting. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think though they also say that they follow the royals kind of like a, a soap opera. And I think they kind of mention it in the book as well, that the yeah. royal family are kind of like a soap opera. And that was maybe I had like a slight problem with that in terms of uh, this idea that the American people would view their own Uh, monarchy as a soap opera because i don't think that that is a dominant view held by british people about the monarchy i think it's only it's only kind of people like us (laughs) who see it that way and we get you know a lot of listeners from other countries or from america in particular who view the british royals like that but i think when you're paying for it the kind of fun soap opera-ness of it can uh seem a little less kind of frivolous and harmless and a bit more like hang on what am i getting for my money yeah and i think especially if in this world the royals are more political, then that's going to bring another element into it as well. So we asked our American listeners to tell us if they wished there was an American monarchy. And I just thought like some of the responses we received were interesting. So one said, I think we have enough celebrities to follow here, but if anyone deserves a crown, it would be Ruth Bader Ginsburg and Oprah. (laughs) (laughs) And then another person said, I think it's so weird to have so many palaces and jewels and only one family that never earned it gets to enjoy it all. And they really don't do anything to earn their keep. I'm glad we don't have it in America, but it's fun to follow from afar. Which kind of sums, that was what a lot of people said. Yeah, like somebody else said, I definitely don't wish we had a royal family here in the US. I don't think it ever would have worked with the values our government purported to express back when the country was being set up. And that would only have gotten more obvious over time. In America, we seem to like to hide our prejudices behind a screen of all men are created equal rather than have visible tears to society based on titles, etc. Not to say either arrangement is at all a good one. I think it's very like interesting to talk about like the values that set the country up <laughs> because I, I think I mentioned on the last week's episode I was listening to Hamilton quite a lot when I was reading <laughs> this and you know in that you get such a sense of like George Washington not wanting to be any kind of permanent ruler and that he wanted to keep updating it and allow the country to kind of move forward with each new president and things. So I kind of, um, I felt like I was really on that wavelength with you. (laughs) (laughs) 
um, that this listener continued, I think part of the reason I enjoy following the British royal family so much is precisely that we don't have our own royal family and that removal of a relationship lets me forget the issues a bit. Of course, I think it's wrong they live off the taxpayers, but I'm not the one paying those taxes, so I know it's not right, but it's always been a form of escapism for me anyway. I, t- I totally agree with that. That was yeah. exactly how I felt in Ireland. And yeah. now since coming here and becoming a British taxpayer, <laughs> it's just heightened my Republican sentiments. <laughs> yeah. And then we got other ones from Americans saying there's a mystique around the royals. The drama is like watching your neighbor's secrets take place, <laughs> 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 which is good. And then another listener pointed out that Supporting worthwhile causes is something one does. Being paid to do so by the taxpayers strikes me as quite the racket. Our current elected leader is frightening. Your head of state and their family seem relatively harmless, but rather ridiculous. (laughs) And what's the deal with the wacky hats? (laughs) (laughs) Well, we'll never be able to answer that. Um, But that's the thing, I suppose. Like, they do seem kind of harmless until you start thinking about the whole institution and the history of it. So I think it helps in this that the person who founded this uh, monarchy is like somebody that Americans look to as being like an all-round good guy. But regardless of who sets up that kind of society, the reality of it in the book is that you end up with this tiered aristocratic society like you have in the UK, uh, where you have like working class, middle class, and then aristocrats who have been given their titles by the king yeah and i do think it's a bit strange to be introducing this new class structure that is such a part of british society but is quite different from how class operates in america and not to interrogate the class tensions that are such a part of the british class system but speaking of that kind of world building what did you think of the world of american royals as i said i I was paying particular attention to any kind of hints of the british monarchy and i did like how those were sort of reimagined with an american perspective i've never been to washington but i did enjoy the descriptions of washington palace and the college campus and the kind of local hotspots and stuff and I I really like those scenes where the king goes for his runs. That did kind of remind me of like Scandal or something. (laughs) Yeah, That that was very evocative, I thought. And I thought it was was very clever to do this kind of mashup of real places and fictional places. So you had like Harvard University, but you also had King's College, which I've heard some people say is kind of like Georgetown. Okay. But that that's the college where all the royals go to traditionally. Oh, and another thing I really liked that I thought was very smart was that Catherine McGee uses jewellery to tell the history. For example, there is a pair of diamond hair clips in one passage that King George II won from the French king Louis XVI in a game of cards called Louisiana Gamble. And this resulted in France ceding America the Louisiana Territory this sort of rewriting of history in a really like fun way yeah i I like that i mean (laughs) i was less of a fan obviously of all the (laughs) slurs on tea that happened uh there's a a line there's a princess drinking tea it's the end of the monarchy (laughs) so uh, even though america hadn't been at war with britain for 200 years everyone still acted as though drinking tea were a deeply unpatriotic act the palace refused to even serve tea at any of its events, only coffee. <laughs> <laughs> that was pretty good. Yeah, that was really clever. I thought that was funny. Something that was really on my mind a lot when reading it was this kind of air and spare because we've seen Harry and Will, because we had that kind of storyline with the Queen and Princess Margaret in the crown. That's been very much like in my mind a lot. But what did you think about the relationship between Beatrice and Sam? I think it was a pretty classic example of the air and spare relationship it was interesting that jeff didn't really seem to play into that at all yeah. because as we said they're twins but i think there was a moment in the book where they point out that sam was born like a few minutes earlier or something so yeah. she's technically the older twin which i wonder if that will come into play in the second book but we'll talk about that later i thought yeah very early on you have the spare characterized as an insurance policy a living breathing backup battery And we know, like, we've talked so much, even with, like, Charles and Andrew, the idea that when you are the spare, this idea of feeling lost and that you don't know what your purpose is and that often they can go a bit wild. 
<laughs> and Samantha really feels that so strongly. She says perhaps she and Jeff would just be professional wastrels, a drain on the economy for the rest of their lives. Maybe that just suggests they're taxpayer funded. Anyway, um, <laughs> the king does have a scene where he tells Samantha that she has to serve as a lightning rod to handle all the negativity and jealousy that people don't dare show Beatrice, which makes her realize that some of the criticism she bore might actually be criticism of Beatrice or of the monarchy more broadly, which funneled to her simply because there was nowhere else it could go. Well, yeah, especially like, you know, if they are taxpayer funded, which it seems like they might be, that kind of sentiment always flares up when one member of the royal family does something that is kind of a bit controversial or can attract kind of criticism. But the criticism isn't only about that one action. It it comes from this whole feeling of like, we support this institution and this yeah. institution isn't performing as we want it to. One of our listeners summed it up. The heir wants what the spare has. Freedom, the spare wants what the heir has. Importance. And I wonder, will they get what they want in the second book but let's talk about the ending the king dies he has a heart attack like a heart complication as a result of him being ill for a long time with cancer and it happens just as beatrice is telling him she's going to break off her engagement with teddy and she wants to be with connor and then he has this fucking heart attack yeah and she's like freaking out he starts coughing up blood and they go to hospital and then the whole city shuts down basically it's described that crowds are gathered outside the hospital that people are walking into the streets they're so blinded by tears Mm -hmm. that nobody's at work there's just this enormous what they say an enormous outpouring of love and support for the royal family this is again like another moment where it really felt like there wasn't a republican voice in the story because I mean, it makes sense, I suppose, at this kind of moment that they would be surrounded by people coming to the hospital who really loved the royal family. But uh, it was quite overwhelming, even for me reading it, to have all these crowds, especially when Beatrice becomes the new queen after her father's death. That moment was quite strange to me. Mm. I mean, because we've recently had our prime minister here very ill and by some accounts, close to death. As well, because the queen over here is so old. And when she was sick last year or a couple of years ago, people started to get very worried. Mm. And I was just trying to imagine, you know, as we live in London, what would happen? You know, I can't imagine people gathering outside a hospital if either the prime minister or the queen were that sick. But I guess it is quite different because the king in in this book is only 50. He's very young and that's very shocking. But anyway... Eventually he dies and the doctor, for some reason, comes out while Beatrice and her siblings are doing a walkabout and the sight of him is enough to let everyone know that the king has died and everybody just falls into like a very deep bow or curtsy and Beatrice curtsies to the people and it's this real idea of servitude because she realizes in that moment that when she dips into the curtsy she's a princess and when she rises back up again she's a queen and she's now assuming her new role in service to the people I did find it strange that she had to find out in front of everybody else and like cried very publicly but it did make for a very sort of cinematic moment Yeah, very cinematic, and I think it allowed for that moment of... We've talked about it before in the podcast, the way that the monarchy likes to, or monarchists as well, like to characterise being royal as a form of service. So this is her, like, pledging her service to the people as much as they are pledging their service to her. But I was really put off, like you say, by the fact that the doctor ran out onto the steps. I thought that went actually not just against what I thought would happen in British royals, but even what I would imagine would happen in this stiff Washington palace kind of manner where bitches have etiquette masters and every aspect of their public appearance is kind of managed. I didn't think that the doctor would run out. It was very soap opera. Yeah. So the king is dead, long live the queen. What do you think is going to happen in the second book? What I would like to happen is for Beatrice to rip up the real book, to dump Teddy and to marry Connor. Catherine Gee seems particularly interested in this idea of a, a woman queen and how complicated that's going to be in terms of the opposition that she's going to face from sexist people who don't want a female queen. Mm-hmm. And then to add to that, her marrying a commoner 
would just make it like even more deliciously complicated yeah. and add greater drama. So I can see the appeal of that. But ultimately, I do think she's going to stay on the throne. I know you feel a little bit differently about that, though. I think she's going to abdicate and be with Connor. And I think that, you know, the second book could be, could involve her finding out about another life that she could live. It's something that we saw happen in The Crown, where the Queen kind of imagines this life of horse rearing and and stuff um, if she didn't have all the duty. So I wonder, would that be an interesting thing for Catherine McGee to... Or uh, in Scandal, Vermont. Exactly. The jam. The, the jam. And I make jam. And you make jam. And I thought, you know, she would abdicate and that Samantha would become queen because I feel like she's on this kind of trajectory where she's finding purpose and she wants to do more and that maybe this could be a comment that it's not always the person who's born first who is best suited to the job. I think Sam will get to be with Teddy in mm-hmm. in my version where Beatrice stays on the throne. Sam will take on the more active role in the Washington Trust, her dad's charitable foundation, because in the book he asked her to be on the board. And now I feel like she's just going to take over the whole thing and that that might help her find her purpose. Yeah. Then Jeff, I think Nina and Jeff will find their way back to each other. But I don't particularly need to hear any more about them. I did enjoy Nina's parts, but they were less engaging than the other three. They served like a good purpose, I think technically, in terms of getting us information about how this court works and things, because she was coming at it from a relatively outside perspective. I think maybe in the second book we'll have got that. So I could see how, you know, I like her and I I like that their storyline kind of had echoes of Harry and Meghan with all the tabloid kind of scrutiny she had to go through and I sort of imagined him as quite a like kind of scruffy haired like Mm -hmm. fun prince so uh, much like Harry but yeah I agree I don't necessarily need to see much more of them what about Daphne well I want to see a lot more of her I think we're gonna have this revenge storyline with Himari because she's gonna wake up and I was like a bit disappointed okay with this because I felt like Daphne's crime which is something they've been hinted at all through the book was going to be a lot worse she sits next to Himari who's in a coma in hospital and she talks to herself and she talks to Himari about how she's responsible for this so I really thought that she would have pushed her down the stairs it turns out that it's still really bad she roofied her to try and stop her from spilling some secrets and she ended up falling down the stairs and I think that that difference, the difference between pushing and this kind of indirect action means that Daphne is going to be rehabbed in the next book. I think she's going to try to atone for what she's done. I think Himari will be very villainous. I think she's going to have like a revenge storyline. And I think that ultimately Daphne will win. She'll do her penance and then she'll be with Ethan. I can see that happening. I definitely want to see her have a big blowout with her parents and like break up with her parents basically. And I, I'm on board for her redemption. I mean, she's only 17, for God's sake. <laughs> I'm not going to hold it against her. But yeah, I definitely want her to be free to be with Ethan. I thought he was very hot, and I think they'll be good together. <laughs> yeah. But the blurb for the second book, which is called Majesty, goes as follows. Beatrice Washington now rules America as its first ever queen, but her family are more concerned about rushing through her arranged marriage to a man she barely knows. No one can now know that her heart really belongs to her bodyguard, but even their love is under threat. Oh my god, what could be threatening their love? Meanwhile, Princess Samantha is under more scrutiny than ever before, and she still longs to be with her sister's fiancé, but with no sign of Bee's wedding being called off, she's surprised to find someone else catching her eye. Oh my god. I did hear Catherine McGee talking about a Duke of California. That is a character she's very excited about in the second book. So I wonder if that's going to be yeah. Sam's new boyfriend. Yeah, I think that we might get a bit of a, I want to say Noah Centineo effect, but what's the character in um, To All the Boys? Peter Kavinsky. Peter Kavinsky, where we're going to get a threat come in in the second book, who will ultimately not be that much of a threat. The blurb continues, Nina Gonzalez is also tangled up with someone she never expected to be. She and Ethan are both nursing broken hearts, and it's not long before they find themselves pulled irresistibly together. I was so surprised by this. I didn't see this coming. No, no way. 
I don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> I just feel like Ethan has this kind of low-key evil side to him that w- really balances with Daphne. Yeah. Speaking of Daphne, Prince Jeff's griefs for his father makes him a prime target for her attentions. She's the closest she's been in years to getting what she wants. So why can't she let the idea of her and Ethan go? I mean, I can't let it go either. <laughs> they've, got to, they've got to be together. <laughs> They also, the blurb also mentions the royal wedding of the century creeping ever closer. So are we going to have Beatrice dumping Teddy the on altar. the day of the wedding? Wow. Will we have crowds gathered at whatever their version of Westminster Abbey is? And will Teddy ever be able to save his family from financial ruin? <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm definitely going to read the second one. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, after we've read the Thousandth Floor series. <laughs> but we thought it would be fun to do a little dream casting mm-hmm. for a film adaptation. Because I do think this is pretty ripe territory for, if not a blockbuster series, then a Netflix movie for sure. Oh, yeah. I really liked we asked our followers on Instagram who they would cast. And much like Tom, everyone <laughs> they suggested was in their 40s. <laughs> Tom could only think... <laughs> of <laughs> actors who were like 42 to play 17 year olds <laughs> hey I've got a type <laughs> <laughs> but okay let's let's go through so I thought a good candidate to play Beatrice would be Lily Reinhardt she plays Betty on Riverdale yeah. but I know they're meant to be brown haired and Although we have seen Dark Betty on Riverdale. <laughs> no one was convinced. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking Diana Silvers, who was the hot girl in Booksmart. I thought she would be uh, a good contestant because she has the very elegant bone structure. She's yeah. very beautiful, brown hair. I thought she might be a, a good option for Beatrice and then for Samantha because we know Samantha it said has quite a wide forehead and very heavy brows and she's not like conventionally beautiful but obviously she's still beautiful and I thought Eliza Scanlon could be a good pick for her she is in Sharp Objects she plays Amy Adams half sister and she's also Beth in the most recent Little Women yeah I think she would be so good I would definitely watch that. I really like her as an actress. And then for Nina, I think this would be great if you had Jenna Ortega, who was in the second season of You. She's the teenager that's like always annoying Joe, but she also plays the young Jane the Virgin in Jane the Virgin. And she's so good. Yeah. I feel like she would really do that kind of like cool, grungy kind of look that Nina has, but she's also like quite feisty like yeah she's like the bullshit she's so good she would bring like so much interest to that role i think it'd be really good and then daphne who's meant to be like the most beautiful woman in the world that anybody's ever seen anya taylor joy who (laughs) is incredibly beautiful and is blonde but looks good with dark hair she had dark hair a couple years ago yeah i thought she would be very good at the kind of evil scheming like she did she was emma in the most recent adaptation of emma the film and she was also in the miniaturist which was a really good period drama if you're looking for another period drama like tom <laughs> yeah, and yeah. i <laughs> but i know tom bagsy doing all the hunks <laughs> yeah so i took charge of the the dudes and i've gone for Joe Keery from Stranger Things, he's the guy with all the hair, as Jeff. Because I think, give him a bit of a haircut, but still that kind of like scruffy look. Very hot, very good. And then for Connor, well, we just watched... <laughs> <laughs> we just watched Never Have I Ever, which is a new Mindy Kaling show on Netflix. And That's so good. So Darren Barnett, who plays Paxton Hall Yoshida, is so hot right now. And I think he would be such a good bodyguard. <laughs> Even though he's 29. <laughs> But this is perfect because he can play, like, closer to his actual age. <laughs> so, for Teddy, I thought we could have someone like Tom Holland, who's very charming, but in maybe more of a plays by the rules, kind of nice guy kind of way. Yeah, I British, could see that. A British way. He, uh, does, he does an American accent in Spider-Man. Oh, yeah, no, I know. That's why I cast him, because of his incredible voice work. <laughs> accent work. <laughs> And Nothing to do with that <laughs> dreamy face. <laughs> and then for Ethan, I was thinking Jordan Fisher, 
who played John Ambrose McLaren in the second to all the boys I love before film. Yeah, I could definitely see him doing that kind of low-key evil yeah, kind yeah. of scheming with Daphne. And like very hot, but still it's the kind of like hot where it's like he's the low-key, not obvious choice. So he's good best friend material for the prince. Yeah. Yeah, I think this would be a great movie. So let's, let's, get, it on. <laughs> let's get it going. But since we have spent the past couple of weeks reading this book, I thought we should pull one of the quotes from it as our quote of the week. What do you think is your standout? I think it's when Teddy says to Beatrice, if this was a world where people could, I don't know, vote for their monarch, I know that America would still pick you. I would pick you. And I really liked it mainly because I feel like this is how Will thinks anyway. This is how Kate has to reassure him. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. I, I think that there is certainly at the moment with the royal family, this real thing of like popularity contest and who's the most beloved and... You know, if you're, you know, next in line or further up the line, then you should be more popular because that gives like a semblance that this is in some way democratic. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I totally agree. Aren't you fit for a queen? Yeah, a Zoom related, (laughs) Zoom based. Well, I just, I know it was like only from shoulders up basically, but I liked seeing Kate did a couple of Zoom calls this week to first time parents ahead of maternal mental health awareness week and it was so funny the Sunday Times had an interview with some of the new mothers that she talked to and they were like it was really surreal I had a baby took a two hour nap and then I was on (laughs) zoom to the Duchess of Cambridge (laughs) this is like Kate's idea of like when's an appropriate time to talk to someone after they've given birth she's like like half an hour surely (laughs) No, she was very nice and very sympathetic. Like, you must be so tired, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, she was wearing this blue and white jumper from Tabitha Webb, which has a chevron stripe pattern on it. And I just thought it was such a nice jumper. It was the same brand that did that green chevron stripe pussy bow blouse that we were raving about a few months ago. (laughs) So I like that she has her go-to chevron stripe brand. I don't feel like I'm that affected by the duchess effect but last time she wore the chevrons i was like maybe i should get like a chevron shirt or something <laughs> and now seeing this jumper i'm like oh, chevrons are really good in a jumper actually so maybe <laughs> i could find something so yeah she's had a, a big effect on me this week she also wore her notorious <laughs> shamrock hoop earrings the daniela draper mini hoops with the shamrock charm removed She's not in Ireland now. She doesn't need the shamrocks. I know. She tossed those shamrocks (laughs) (laughs) as soon as she was back on the flight out of Dublin. But anyway, there was another jewellery moment that was quite a major moment for us this week. Yeah, like I really liked Kate's outfit, but I think my pick would be Megan on her Zoom call to Smartworks team. So she was wearing her red Joseph V-neck jumper and this necklace from Edge of Ember, which features evil eye motif. Oh my god. I think we've talked about either this necklace or another necklace she has with an evil eye on it. Yeah. This is clearly a, a, a favourite of hers. Yeah. And I love the idea that, obviously, she's so into all that stuff of, like, warding off negativity. Talismans. Yeah. And it's a timely piece of jewellery yeah, for yeah. her. It's also she looked like... totally amazing. Oh, yeah. So good. Yeah, yeah. But first in line, who's it going to be? I think I would pick Harry as first in line this week. Mm-hmm. Primarily because I was so swept away by the quality of his videos, but also because both of the projects we saw him doing this week, the HeadFit launch and the Thomas the Tank Engine episode, are such indisputable choices. Like, there's you can't pick anything controversial in those. Yeah, they are so innocent, so thoughtful. When Megan did the Disney documentary, there was so much criticism of like, oh, so American, so Disney, so schmaltzy. But British people love Thomas the Tank Engine (laughs) and they love military veterans. So there's no no criticism for this. And I thought that was like a smart little move on his part. Yeah, I totally agree. I thought he uh, played a blinder. I do think he should, if it was his friend who spoke to the Telegraph, I think he needs to get his friends in line though. Yeah, that was like a not a good look for him. So he needs to take control. What do we think is going to happen next week? Well, on Wednesday, Archie Harrison Mountbatten Windsor turns one year old. And we know from Sunday Times a couple of weeks ago that we will be getting a new 
picture of Archie. Don't know how we're going to get it, but that'll be exciting. Uh, now that Kate has set the bar sky high, yeah. what can this one-year-old possibly do to top the fresh pasta? You know, these food deliveries aren't going to cut it anymore, guys. This is a picture of Archie. Uh, he's holding the vaccine for coronavirus that he developed <laughs> over the last two weeks. <laughs> It is also in the most British news of the week, the 75th anniversary of VE Day on Friday, and we will be getting another televised address from the Queen. Like, you wait 10 years for them, (laughs) and they come along in trios. This is going to be on Friday, and as well as making her little televised address at 9pm, which is the same time her father made his address... 75 years ago, she will be leading the nation in a public sing-along of Vera Lynn's We'll Meet Again. This, like, Queen's karaoke hour. (laughs) I mean, are we going to see, like, a really awkward video of Charles and Camilla on Karen's house Instagram of them, like, closing the door to the porch and singing along, just the two of them? Camilla and her ballet pumps. Are the royals going to participate? This is so wild. I I mean, I'm going to be playing the wolf tones. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to play Aaron Naveen. <laughs> no, I'm joking. But I'm very interested to see how many people actually take part in this single. Oh, yeah. I'm going to have uh, my ears hanging out the window. <laughs> you will be standing outside the front door of our building with a fucking foghorn. <laughs> singing along or maybe you'll get your triangle like camilla oh yeah that would be amazing (laughs) i guess i yeah i'll get into it i'm sure but thank you so much for listening we would love to hear your thoughts on american royals and what you think is going to happen in book two and if you enjoyed this royal book club if you have any other recommendations of royal books you think we should read or talk about you can let us know on instagram or Twitter at AirheadsPod, or on Facebook at AirHeads, or you can email us at airheadspod at gmail.com. And if you like this episode, please leave us a five-star review and tell a friend. We hope you come back and join us next week. And we'll meet again. <laughs> Bye! Bye! Oh, mother, may I please?